you for this opportunity to give a presentation. It is something I covered already in the SIG, but this is a shorter version, and I also make very sure not to reuse the same jokes. So you don't need to feel sorry for yourself if you're also there for the SIG. So what I'll be talking about is the string database, of which I'm one of the main developers. So it's a collaboration between three labs, one at EMBL in Heidelberg, one at University of Zurich, and one at University of Copenhagen, which is my group. And the string database is all about linking proteins to other proteins based on all kinds of evidence we can get our hands on. So integrating large scale data sets and also at the same time combining that with text mining. So the starting point for making string is really a set of 9.6 million proteins in the latest version. And that's a collection of all the genes, all the protein coding genes from something like 2,000 different organisms. And what we want to do with those is really to link them to each other with functional associations. So we want to tie proteins together with other proteins that we have some reason to believe are functioning together. And how can you do that? Well, the first thing you can do is to make use of the fact that you have a lot of genomes and use so-called genomic context methods. The idea in genomic context is that you look across genomes and try to use the other genomes to help infer functional associations that you may not be able to see from one genome. The simplest to understand is the gene fusion method. And just to outline it, imagine that you and your organism of interest have two different genes, the red and the yellow, and now you're looking across other genomes, and what you see is that in some genomes, you in fact have a fusion gene where the red and the the red and the yellow gene have been fused together, forming a fusion gene that encodes a fusion protein. If you think about it from the point of view of a cell for a second, it's pretty obvious that it wouldn't make any sense to take two proteins that have nothing to do with each other whatsoever and covalently link them together and make them one big protein. So the fact that this fusion protein exists in some organisms is evidence that even in the other organisms where it's two separate proteins, they likely function together. Another thing you can do is look at gene neighborhoods. That's particularly true if you're interested in prokaryotes. Of course, in a single genome, you could already look at which genes are sitting next to each other, possibly forming an operon, but it becomes much stronger evidence when you use the power of evolution and you, use, you look across hundreds of millions of years of evolution and you see, is this a conserved structure? Do we see some conservation that these genes tend to sit next to each other, being transcribed in the same direction in very distantly related organisms? Lastly, you can use so-called phylogenetic profiles. This is perhaps the hardest to understand of the methods. And the idea here is that you are profiling across a species tree, which is what you have on the left, the presence absence patterns of different genes. So you're looking at this gene is present in some organisms, absent in other organisms, and then you link genes to each other that have the same or very similar presence absence profiles. This is, of course, an idealized toy example it's idealized in the sense that the profiles match perfectly, and it's a toy example because you're looking at just a few handfuls of different organisms, whereas we're looking across 2,000. So there's no way I could show you the actual tree in this projector. The idea is quite simply that if you look at this pattern, it doesn't follow the tree. So it's not just that you know all gamma proto-bacteria have this gene and other organisms don't. It's really a complicated pattern that requires many gains and losses of these genes to obtain. And it's very unlikely that these patterns would, by random chance, just match up. So the re when you see this co-evolution in terms of a, of a pattern like this, it probably suggests to you that these three genes form some functional module that allows an organism to do X. And if you have all three, you're able to do X. If you were to be missing one of them, you wouldn't be able to do X, for which reason the other two wouldn't have any purpose. So you're gonna lose those pretty quickly in evolution. Of course, if you really want to get a good network, you can't just look at the genomes alone. You have to integrate other experimental data that can be things like gene co-expression, so it could be looking at old-fashioned two-channel microarrays, more modern arrays, RNA-seq data. It doesn't really matter which type of expression data you're looking at. The point here is you're looking across hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of different conditions, and you're looking at which genes are systematically co-expressed, which genes are expressed under the same conditions. 
Again, if you see genes being tightly co-regulated like that, it's fairly strong evidence that they function together in some process in the cell. The next thing, of course, is kind of the obvious, is that you go to the interaction databases if you want interactions. So you go to databases like BIND, INDACT, BioGrid, you name it, and you collect all the different physical interactions that have been deposited in these repositories, and you put that together. One important thing to be aware of there is that there are many different interaction assays, and you really need to integrate data across the different assays. Because the problem you have is, and that's what this figure is depicting, is that different assays work well for different types of proteins. So you'll see some assays work well for nuclear proteins, some assays don't work well for nuclear proteins. Most assays don't work well for transmembrane proteins, but there are assays that do. So whenever you see these studies where people claim to have found the entire interactome of an organism using one assay, you, you pretty much know it ain't so, because there is not a single assay that works well for every protein. Last but not least, we of course take the low-hanging fruit. We take the curated knowledge. There will be things like protein complexes where we're not talking about somebody published a yeast 2 hybrid screen claiming that these two proteins bind to each other. We're talking about things, we know this complex exists. We know there's something, some complex, it has a name, we know what it does, we possibly have a 3D structure of it. It's sort of really beyond doubt that this is a complex that exists. Another thing is established pathways. So other people than I have probably had to take biochemistry exams where they had to learn something like this by half and happily forget it again afterwards. This, of course, exists like databases, wiki pathways, reactome, keck, you name it. And of course, we take a lot of these different databases, we pass them, and we put them into the string database. Now, when I describe it like this, it may sound like doing the string database really ain't that hard. How much work can it be? Well. There are many databases. That's the first bad news. We can't even get the 2,000 genomes from one place. We have to go to several different sources to collect the initial genomes. We have to go to many different interaction databases, many different pathway databases, etc., etc. These, of course, tend to use different file formats, call the same genes different things. Different data sets, even in the same database, may be of completely different quality. And things are just fundamentally not comparable. I mean, how do you compare gene fusion to co-expression to a yeast to hybrid screen to a pathway database? It's just not the same thing. So some of this, dealing with these problems, some of it is just hard work. You know, there's a lot of databases, somebody has to download them. They're in different formats, somebody has to write parcels. And they use different identifiers, somebody has to make mapping files. There's not really more to say about that. That's just hard work, you need people doing it and then it works. Where it gets interesting is more how do you deal with the issue of things having variable quality and things not being comparable to each other. And that's where the concept of quality scores become very important. And the first thing we do is develop what we call raw quality scores, which is quality scores for a specific type of data. So for example, looking at something like affinity purification assays. So somebody has done a big screen, they've done a lot of pull downs where what you do is you put a tag on some protein, then you do a pull down on some column or beads or whatever, and you're pulling down the protein together with whatever is bound to it. Once you've done that, you identify what is in that mixture by sending the mixture into mass spectrometry. So you have a bunch of pull downs here. You tag the blue protein, you got a pull down that contains the green protein and a couple of other proteins. You tagged another protein, you, you got the blue and the green, as well as a few other proteins. You tagged yet another protein, you saw the blue but not the green. You tagged the green, you saw a few proteins, but the blue was not among them. And now you want to somehow summarize this evidence landscape into a single number that somehow correlates with whether this interaction is more or less likely to be correct. And it's pretty trivial that, of course, what you want is the kind of pull downs that you have in the, the two to the left. They are the kinds that are evidence for the interaction. And, of course, the two to the right, where you see one protein but not the other, are evidence against. So you could somehow turn this into a score. There are many ways of doing it. You could imagine you know how many pull downs you did in total. You know how many contain A. You know how many contain B. You know how many contain A and B. Two by two contingency table, Fisher's exact test, p-value, happy days. Except not so happy days because that scoring scheme doesn't actually work very well. 
You can do other things, observed over expected ratios. We do something more complicated than that, but that's not the key point. The idea here is more that you take the evidence at hand, you somehow turn it into a number that hopefully correlates well with what is most likely to be correct and what is more likely to be wrong. Then the next step is you calibrate all your scores. And for that, you use an external gold standard. In our case, we use Keck Pathways. And what we do initially is we, just for a second, ignore all the proteins that have not been annotated to pathways. So we ignore all the proteins that we don't know where fall. And then when you're looking at what's left, then of course there are only two options. Two proteins are either on the same pathway or they're not. So what we do is we simply go through this raw quality score, we bin the interactions, and we look at them and say, out of the ones where we are looking at a predicted interaction between two proteins that are both annotated to pathways, in how large a fraction of the cases do we actually see that these two proteins are on the same pathway? And if you look here, something with a raw quality score between 1 and 1.1, it's something like 14% of the interactions that fall within a pathway, which shows you that a score between 1 and 1.1 is a pretty bad score. You do that for all your bins. You see, similarly, if you score between 2 and 2.1, it means that there's something like an 80% chance of the proteins being in the same pathway, so that's a good score. You fit some function through it, typically some sigmoid function, because it sort of tapers off at the end, but at some point it doesn't really get any better. And that's your calibration curve. And now when I come with two proteins where one of them or both of them, I don't know which pathway they're on, I take the evidence at hand, I calculate my raw quality score, I go in, I find it is maybe 1.7, and then I look up 1.7, and, and I find out that 1.7 means that there's about 50-50 chance of it being correct. So that way, I can take any piece of evidence and turn it into a score. And of course, I make these calibration curves for different experiments. I make them for different evidence types. They have completely different raw quality scores on the x-axis, but that doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you turn them into probabilities. So by doing this, you achieve two key things. One is implicit weighting by quality. It's a question that always comes with string. How do you weight things? Well, we don't actively do that. It falls out of the benchmarking. When you do the score calibration, if you have an experiment that is really bad, then presumably the interactions they found in that experiment will not correlate well with pathways. So you're gonna get a curve that is pretty flat. No matter what the raw quality score is, the probability of being in the same pathway is low. If you have a, an experiment that is really good, then maybe no matter what the raw quality score is, the probability of being in the same pathway is high. So we implicitly weigh things by quality through this benchmarking. The other thing we get out of it is we put everything on a common scale. Before, we had things like Pearson correlation coefficients across microarray studies, uh, these observed over expected ratio like scores, bunch of other scores, and whatever it was, we've now turned everything into what is the probability of being in the same pathway given this piece of evidence. That means we now have everything on a common scale. Except we don't have everything, because at this point we're missing most of the data. If I'm looking at the human interaction network in the string database, everything I've told you about so far adds up to about 10% of the evidence. So where's the other 90%? Well, the other 90% is here. This is a back of the envelope estimate of the scientific literature. If we assume everything is indexed in PubMed, if we assume that each article is only about five, five pages long, you print them all out on standard 80 gram A4 paper and you stack them on top of each other, you get a pile well over 10 kilometers. If we make more realistic estimates, it's probably also more than 20 kilometers, but that doesn't really matter, does it? Because there's just too much to read. You can't read it, I can't read it, we can't read it, so we need to get a computer to read it. So that's where we're getting to text mining. And when I need to get a computer to try to understand text that is written, by, written for humans, or in general, if I try to get a computer to do anything that is halfway intelligent, I find it useful to think about this analogy that a computer is about as smart as a dog. And by that I mean if I put sufficient effort into it, I can teach it to do specific tricks. And borrowing a cartoon, what we say to dogs, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. You stay out of the garbage or else. And the only thing the dog understands is his own name. 
I'm, that's sort of roughly my level of ambition when I try to get a computer to read scientific literature. Not that the computer understands its own name, but that the computer understands names of stuff being mentioned in the text, but the majority of the text is in between is going to be blah, blah, blah to the computer. That's what I'm doing. And this step, by the way, for people doing text mining who like to use complicated terms for doing simple things, is called named entity recognition, which if you think about it means recognizing stuff with names. And if you want to recognize stuff with names, what you need is a long list of names, a comprehensive lexicon of the stuff you want to text mine. So you need what are, what are all the entities you want to identify and what are all the different synonyms we have for it. So you need to know that there's something called cycle-independent kinase 1. You need to know there's something called CDC2, and you need to know it's in fact the same thing. You need to deal with autographic variation, which is the long way of saying that things can be written in slightly different ways. Um, dealing with things like spaces and hyphens. You have in your dictionary there's something called cycle-independent kinase 1, but the paper you're trying to text mine writes it with a hyphen. You have things like prefixes and suffixes. You know you have a gene called CDC2. You're now looking at a paper that studies CDC2 in human and mouse and rat, and it gets rather confusing that all three orthologs are called CDC2. So when you talk about the human CDC2, you're very friendly and put an H in front of it to make my life easier. Uh, of course, if I don't have that in my dictionary as a synonym, you didn't make my life easier. So for that reason, we need to automatically add prefixes like species prefixes in front of everything. We need to know whenever you have a yeast gene, you might put a P on the end of it to tell me you actually meant the protein, things like that. Last but not least, we need a blacklist. And a blacklist is a list of all the names that are in your dictionary, not because your dictionary is bad. They're completely legitimate names. However, they are names that when you do text mining, most of the time they turn out to mean something entirely different than what you think they mean according to your dictionary. My favorite example of that is the, uh, the HGNC, the Human Gene Naming Committee, who in their infinite wisdom came up with the idea that it was a good idea that the recommended gene symbol of a gene should be this. Um, that's also a detergent. It's all, it's specifically, it's a detergent that you use for uh, quite often when you're studying proteins, SDS gels, SDS page, denaturing po proteins in SDS. So if you, you can imagine how well it's going to go if you think every time that somebody mentions SDS in a paper, they're talking about the SDS gene. That's going to be an absolute disaster. Especially since the next thing we do is we do co-mentioning, which means that pretty much every protein would have been co-mentioned with the SDS protein. So. We need to somehow score this, of course. When you have co-mentioning like this, you could easily have randomly the two genes are mentioned together and it doesn't really mean anything. But what we do is fancy statistics, also known as counting, and we count how often they're mentioned together. We count how often they're mentioned together within the same document, how often they're mentioned within the same paragraph, how often they're mentioned within the same sentence, and we combine all of that into a combined quality score that really summarizes how strongly co-mentioned are these two genes, taking into account co-mentions at all three levels, and of course, knowing that being mentioned in the same sentence is much stronger evidence than being mentioned in completely different paragraphs of a paper. And then again, we take these scores and we calibrate them against the very same gold standard that we use for everything else. So that also becomes probability of being on the same pathway given that you've been co-mentioned this much. We combine all the evidence and the next thing we do is we show the networks. So that's really sort of the end result. And all that's left to do at this point is make it available to people. And we do that in a number of ways. One is we have the string web resource. And the string web resource is something we put a lot of work into, in particular the team at, uh, in Zurich. So that's really mainly meant, maybe not so much for this crowd, but more for the wet lab biologists who are interested in a handful of proteins and want to look those up and look in detail at all the evidence. Then for people who want to do really global analysis, we have the download files. You can go download the whole network for all organisms or for an organism of interest to you. You can ask, access things via REST API, if you're into R, there's a bioconductor package for string as well, so you can use string within bioconductor. And most recently, together with Scooter from UCSF, we've been developing a Cytoscape app that allows people to, from within Cytoscape, pull string networks and have them visualized exactly the way they look in string in the web interface, but at the same time have the whole power of Cytoscape to map data onto it whichever way they want. So with that, I just want to acknowledge
all the people who did the hard work. So there are many more people who've done work on this over the years. String is a long-going project. But uh, some of the main people, definitely Pierre Borg's group, where it all started and where I did my postdoc and worked as a staff scientist, I spent six years in his group. Christian von Meering running the group in Zurich, and by the way, he was also in Pierre Borg's group before he started his own lab. Then a number of different people, I already mentioned Scooter, who is doing the Cytoscape app with me. Then Damian, former PhD student of mine, who's now in uh, Christian's group in Zurich. So he's been working on string all along, being instrumental to many, many things. Michael Kuhn, similarly. Andrea, a former member of uh, Christian's group. Milan, Alexander, and uh, Sune Frankil was a postdoc of mine who did a lot of the text mining. And thanks for your attention.